Sarah Bodwe here from Horse Racing Nation, joined by Chase Sessoms, the Wolf of Oaklawn. You might know him from his podcast, from his tweets, from his love of sound effects, from all of the great things that we see from you on the internet. Chase, thanks for joining me to talk some Breeders' Cup. I appreciate you picking the three least offensive things about me to describe <laughs> to the crowd. Yeah, at any time. Glad to be here. And we're going to be talking about a race that I think features um, – not the heaviest favorite that we'll see all Breeders' Cup, but maybe the second or the third. And that's going to be the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, where we have Cave Rock, who is a perfect three for three, who's four to five on the morning line. Are we taking him or are we trying to beat him? I'm actually going to try to beat him. Uh, I, I don't think that the the pace really supports uh, Cave Rock's case. And I, I'm actually looking more towards the four or four tape, four to one for Todd Pletcher and Rapoli with the I rat up. Um, you know, there, there's the, the horse that has the, the, the resume that's bringing over. And then there's kind of like the horse of now. And for me, like Forte kind of feels like the, the horse of now that's really just kind of maybe doesn't have the huge speed figures, but just keeps ticking up uh, a, a few ways. And also I really like the way that the horse is going to be coming from off the pace. And I think that he's kind of the alternative that you want if you're going to try to take a shot against a horse like Cave Rock, who is likely to face some pace pressure, um, particularly from a horse like Hurricane J all the way to the inside, because what choice do they have but to go from that rail post? Um, a horse that I don't really see as one with a chance to uh, actually win or hit the board, but really affects the dynamics of this race. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And you have to think this horse, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Hurricane Jay is coming out of two straight sprint races where we had pretty quick opening, you know, opening uh, quarters and the horse has been on the lead going, you know, in each one. Uh, what other move does the horse have? I mean, if it's got something else in reserve that we maybe don't know about yet, then I, OK, but I have a hard time seeing this horse want to actually rate from off the pace when it's done nothing but go to the front and win and in, in two career starts. Right. And I think that the post position draw for this one really forces their hand early on. Um, so I think that this this player is also adding to the entire shape of the race that we have here. Um, another horse that isn't running in here that would have done the same would have been Loggins, who we saw finish second in the Breeders' Futurity behind Forte, a little bit of a controversial um, non-disqualification there for some. But that horse ran um, a huge race in defeat in there. He's bypassing this race. But I think he was one that really would have set things up for some very heated fractions and um, made things a little bit easier for horses like Forte. Without his presence, though, I think we're still seeing enough speed signed on. Absolutely. And I guess the, the big question to me is what does the other Bob do with national treasure? That's a horse. that's only one on the front end, just like his stable mate cave rock. Uh, you, you got to think that if, if Bob has both of his horses dueling each other out, then most likely he's going to put someone in the headlock, like on the way back to the paddock after this race. So I, I don't know exactly what the plan is going to be with national treasure. Is it going to be to try to go out there and, I don't know, run interference or I don't know what the plan is. It makes, it makes national treasure a really interesting, uh, interesting play and almost worth betting the other Bob. You know, I think a lot of people are really interested in betting the other Bob. I don't know how this horse turns the tables on cave rock. Um, but I think that you speak to something that's really important to note of trainer Bob Baffert isn't one that has his horses um, go cancel each other out. He doesn't do that. We saw that in the classic in 2020. Authentic got a very easy, comfortable lead and got to go gate to wire. And he had other horses in that race and they did not take it to him early. He's right. not the one that's just like, good luck guys, uh, figure it out for yourselves. I think that he's going to make sure that National Treasure, Treasure isn't getting in the way of Cave Rock. And I don't know that he could even if he wanted to. Yeah, it's breaking from that far outside of post. You have to think that Cave Rock has the natural advantage coming from the the three hole. Uh, it basically just has to hit the rail, go beat you know uh, beat Hurricane J from the inside, ideally, and then just kind of you know put the head down and run. Whereas you know you have National Treasure who's really gonna have to clear from from way out. I'll tell you one that that's kind of growing on me, and, and it's Blazing Sevens for Chad Brown. I mean, let's go ahead and say a good Magic baby, a good Magic a a. DC juvenile winner uh, for Chad Brown uh, and another horse that's kind of, you know, trending up uh, B 
be interested to see what it can do going two turns over a dry track. This is one that I really wrote off last time because I just felt as though he didn't appreciate the off going and the hopeful, um, though he did finish third in there to Forte and then comes back and upsets the champagne over verifying who's also in this spot. And that, that was a great effort to win his uh, his first grade one in there. Um, but. I don't know what to do with him. Obviously, he's a significant contender, but we've only seen one race from him on a dry track, and that was sprinting six furlongs when he broke his maiden. Yeah, it's it's you're basically it's a hunch bet, and you, if you're going to bet the horse, then you definitely need the price to support a hunch bet. Like I would need Blazing Sevens to probably tick up over ten to one for me to be able to make that hunch bet. Just betting on something that I don't know that the horse can do, you know throwing money basically into the wind and hoping it gets blown back into my face tenfold. <laughs> Isn't that the dream? Um, another horse for Todd Pletcher that I feel like a lot of people are uh, taking some interest in is Lost Ark, who is a half to nest, um, who we're going to see in the distaff as one of the, I think she was and she was made the morning line favorite, correct? Um, going into the distaff. I know there was some conversation of whether it would be her or Malathat, but Lost Ark, I think a lot of people um, feel as though he didn't get a good trip last time in the Brutus Futurity. He had to steady a little bit. He was coming late. I, on figures, I think that he's a little light in comparison to some of these, but another one that has a shot to show up um, and get a piece of it in the later stages if the pace does heat up, and that 20 to 1 on the morning line for a Todd Pletcher juvenile with a big pedigree like his, I think a lot of people will gravitate towards this one as their long shot play. I, I'm trying to practice Todd Pletcher violence baby uh, moderation because I like other Todd Pletcher violence babies later later in the card. But I, you have a very good point, which is the fact that uh, just a, a horrendous trip last out. Absolutely horrendous trip. So, I mean, you draw a line through it. And even when you draw a line through it, the, the figures don't really don't really match up with the rest of the field. However, I mean, it could have been a huge step forward if not for that troubled trip. Who's to say? Exactly. I don't know that he's for me, but I can understand the argument if you do like him a little bit. Um, who else should we talk about? Speaking of big pedigrees, we do have the half to midnight Bisu in the number five verifying going out for Brad Cox, who won this race with essential quality, he finished second last time in the champagne behind blazing sevens and that off track in his first routing attempt, obviously should improve with more ground. You're getting a decent price at 10 to one on the morning line for this horse who has every right to take a step forward too. Yeah, and I guess the big question is going to be, can the horse handle two terms? Coming coming from the back waduct where it's a one-turn mile, uh, you know, something the horse hasn't done yet, which we're dealing with young horses, you're going to have to deal with that quite a bit. Uh, that's why I kind of lean towards Forte, seeing that the horse has won going two turns at Keeneland uh, as, as opposed to verifying. But yeah, verifying looks like it could be a pace casualty. However, if we've got a severely biased uh, Keeneland main track where it's really scraped down, built for speed, and speed is carrying... Uh, who's to say the verifying doesn't get the jump on everybody and take them all the way around. Do you think that he'd be faster early than cave rock? You know, coming from coming from the sprint, you know, background where the horse broke its maiden going six furlongs at Saratoga. I, I think it could put up a fight at least. Uh, cave rock is, is really quick, but also, I mean, 21 seconds to the opening quarter at seven furlongs at Del Mar seems incredibly fast but i feel like it's not quite as fast as the number kind of tells us because it just you seem like you always get those fast refractions out, out west especially at delmar during the summer and i think too obviously we're dealing with a horse with Im immense talent who um is a deserving favorite and honestly i do believe the most likely winner of this race but Going from the West Coast to the East Coast, obviously in the years where the Breeders' Cup is held on the West Coast, this horse would have a home court advantage. I think probably be even a heavier favorite, too, and maybe less East Coast horses would be shipping out to contend with him. Do you kind of give that as a reason for maybe also wanting to play against with the shipping and also trying a new track for the first time? And I don't want to say uh, the numbers are incorrect because I, I, sure. I believe in them, but sure. maybe a track like Del Mar is playing a little bit faster or um, more kindly to speed, though Keeneland obviously also plays very kindly to speed, too. 
Well, I mean, it, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't like imprinted in my DNA to try to beat Bob at, at every given opportunity. So that explains a lot for the, for the cave rock fade. Uh, but also I, I, the pace just seems unsustainable unless somebody changes tactics and decides to take their horse back and rate. Uh, like I said, w- Lord knows what happens with national treasure. Uh, if hurricane Jace decides to surprise us all and set a pocket trip on the rail, then, I mean, it, it's probably K, well, definitely is K rocks race to lose, but I just, I don't think that people sit back and let uh cave rock just get smaller as it, as it, you know, he runs away from the field. Right. Somebody's going to have to do something early and challenge him. And two, I mean, he's already had success at this mile in the 16th, I know, but he does have a very sprinty dam side pedigree. So even let's say he does win this race, he's obviously going to become a very early favorite for the Kentucky Derby pending whatever trainer change will need to happen for him to run in that race. I don't know that he wants to go much farther. Yeah, that's that's the big question. It, it's hard to – the thing with Cave Rock is that, I mean, it's like a limited edition sneaker because it's by Arrogate. We're not going to have any more Arrogates. There's only a handful of Arrogates out there. It's, jury's still kind of out on what all the, the Arrogate babies can do. So, I, I I mean, this is a horse I could easily see running back to, you know, the Malibu a, couple, a day after Christmas, a, two years from now or so, and just really kind of making itself, up, you know, over as a sprinter down the road. Right. Well, I think that he's going to be tough, but I don't think that it's impossible to beat him. Was there anyone else in this field that caught your eye or that you give a chance to, or even that you wanted to toss? Uh, really, I, I'm pretty well settled in on, on Forte. And I think you have to, I mean, all the horses that we mentioned are the ones that you, I think you have to consider if you're either playing uh, exotics or playing to, to win and not betting on Cape Rock. I think the strategy, too, is if you're playing those multis on Breeders' Cup Friday, you either single K Rock or you try to beat him and you don't really try to do both. Right. Yeah, it's at four to five. There, There's really no value in having that horse on your ticket unless it's a it's a stone cold single. So I, I think this is the one where I say if K Rock wins, I lose. All right. Well, taking a stand. I like to hear it. And where can everybody find you and all of your horse racing stands online? Oh, you can always find me being abrasive on Twitter uh, at of Oakland. Uh, Check out my horse racing podcast for the Sports Gambling Podcast Network. It's called the Notorious OTB. You can give that a follow on Twitter at Notorious underscore OTB. And I'm around. Just pop your head out. Say hey. Around. Probably respond. Yeah. Well, I'll be talking with you later today after this recording as well. So you are definitely always around. And thank you for taking the time to talk some Breeders' Cup with me. Yeah, thanks for having me.